This is The Meeting House with Dwight A. Moody. News, reviews, commentary, and conversation on religion and American life. Now, here is Dr. Moody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Meeting House for a very interesting conversation on religion in American life and education in American life and politics and American life, all of it today in The Meeting House. I am your host coming to you from our studio in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Many of you remember that last week I was on the steps of the courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia, broadcasting about the trial of Ahmaud Aubrey. I'll have a lot more to say about that throughout the show today, and my commentary is on that as well. We're coming to you, of course, over radio. Some of you are listening by radio. Uh, from uh, Brunswick, Georgia, St. Simons Island, Georgia, also broadcasting on the uh, video network of St. Stephen's Live, that's St. Stephen's Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, and of course also on the Meeting House Facebook page and also on my Facebook page. My guest today is Lori Carroll, Dr. Lori Carroll, Chancellor at the University of Minnesota in Rochester, uh, Minnesota, and author of a new book, Communicate for a Change. We're going to be talking to her about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but as always, we've got the news brought to you by Perfecto Coffee of California. Order your coffee at perfectocoffeeinc.com. I'm going to be sending Dr. Carroll a package of uh, this coffee straight to her office there in Rochester, Minnesota, as I do all of my guests. But first, the news in the world of religion, uh, the world of, I guess, of American religion. We begin in Los Angeles. Jose Gomez, president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, spoke out strongly against social justice movements during a speech to a meeting of the Congress of Catholics and Public Life in Madrid, Spain. Gomez is Archbishop of Los Angeles. He described the contemporary social justice movements as pseudo-religions that ultimately serve as, quote, dangerous substitutes for true religion. He spoke also against the secularization of Western society and lambasted cancel culture, contending that often what is being canceled are the ideas, values, and practices of the Christian religion. These remarks mirror those of conservative Protestants who often contend that social justice emphases related to such things as climate change and racial reconciliation distort the true gospel. Of course, that's not what I think, and it makes me wonder what Pope Francis thinks about a speech like that. From Louisville, Kentucky, Two seminaries in Kentucky have joined the growing list of companies and organizations going to court to push back against the presidential order requiring many employers to adhere to vaccination and testing protocols during the COVID pandemic. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, from which I hold two degrees, and Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, where I began my theological education, they're two of the largest evangelical seminaries in the country, and they both have filed civil lawsuits in federal court. White evangelical churches, organizations, and institutions have been at the forefront of resistance to local, regional, and national protocols from public health officials. From, from Nashville, Tennessee, United Methodists have been on the verge of dividing or dissolving or imploding for several years, and we've been reporting on it consistently. But the postponement of their annual meeting due to the COVID has given opportunity for mediating influences to gather momentum. The annual conference for 2020 which is, and 2021, which is a global meeting, both were canceled because of their international constituency. Many of their representatives come from 
uh, places where COVID is, is a much more of a threat. It's feared now that their 2022 in-person conference will also be canceled, which means they cannot vote on the protocols that have already been proposed and established. In the meantime, though, a letter circulating among UMC leaders entitled A Call to Grace invokes Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, and I quote, for everything there is a season, end quote. And it reads, in part, it is our intention to shift our focus from legislative solutions that are dependent upon a general conference to supporting strategies for a gracious exit that can be enacted at an annual conference, a central conference, and at jurisdictional levels. And we call upon bishops, conference leaders, and all United Methodists to join us in this effort, end quote. New York, and actually everywhere around the world even, Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, and some Buddhists celebrated the Festival of Lights called Diwali for the five days, November 4 through 9. One of the most po popular festivals rooted in Hinduism, Diwali symbolizes the spiritual victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. The festival is widely associated with Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity, as well as many other regional traditions. Festival activities include, and these, this will sound very familiar to Christians, home decoration, shopping, fireworks, prayers, gifts, and food. Hinduism is the fourth most popular religion in America, trailing Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And finally, from Washington, D.C., hardly a week goes by that we don't have a story coming out of Washington. The National Cathedral, a congregation of the Episcopal Church of America, was filled to overflowing for the funeral of one of the most respected soldiers, statesmen, and citizens of the United States, Colin Powell. Although a wide range of people spoke, it was a thoroughly Christian funeral of the Episcopal kind, recognizing that Powell himself was a very active and committed Episcopal layman. A son of Jamaican immigrants born in Harlem, raised in the Bronx, Powell discovered his life's mission in the army and rose through the ranks to serve presidents of both parties. He became the first black member of the military to serve as its top officer the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and also the first to serve as Secretary of State. It was what his son, Michael K. Powell, called a true American journey, a phrase drawn from the title of Mr. Powell's autobiography. Lead minister for the funeral was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, the Reverend Michael Curry. Now here he is, Hadiza Jabril, singing Precious Lord, Take My Hand at the funeral of General Powell in the National Cathedral. Ms. Jabril is a member of the U.S. Army Band and sings with the U.S. Army Voices. Let's take a listen. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me. Stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on.
That was Adiza Jabril singing Precious Lord Take My Hand at the funeral of Colin Powell in the National Cathedral, Washington of last week. I've watched almost all of that uh, service. I commend it to you. It's a very inspirational service uh, for an inspirational life. And uh, it's done good for the whole country. My guest today is a dear friend and an acclaimed administrator, Professor Dr. Lori Carroll, Chancellor of the University of Minnesota at Rochester. For many years, she was a professor of communication at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh, and that's when our paths crossed. I was launching and leading the Academy of Preachers and hosting festivals for young preachers around the country. Dr. Carroll was interested in all this. She has done a lot of professional research in sermons and how they communicate and if they communicate. And we got in touch and now she's the chancellor of a great university and still engaged in matters of public rhetoric. With Robert Rimsky, a professor of education at the University of Pennsylvania, they have written and published a book entitled Communicate for a Change revitalizing conversations for higher education. Dr. Carroll, you describe yourself in the very first paragraph. We are talkers who believe in conversation for its own sake. We want our conversation to promote change. I wanna say you've described precisely my philosophy here in the meeting house. So you're in the right place today to talk today about communication all over the country. Welcome to the Meeting House. Dwight, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, before we get onto the book, uh, let's talk just a little bit about uh, the pandemic, why don't we? Uh, you write in the book about being quarantined with your daughter. <laughs> uh, tell us about that and tell us about uh, the impact of the pandemic on your work and on the university in general? Well, I think educators all over have had similar challenging struggle during this time. And really we're talking about multiple disruptions. In addition to the pandemic, there has been so much challenge, certainly here in Minnesota, but across the country and the globe. So while we've adapted with technology to being distant, uh, we are suffering in terms of social cohesion and mm -hmm. rebuilding trusting relationships and doing that for an educational environment. So lots of challenge all over, I'm, I'm sure most of us have experienced. Sure, the business world, and of course, I am a pastor now in the church world, and there's just an awful lot of chatter and writing about ministers who are burnt out and ministers who are leaving uh, because of the, the pressure that the pandemic has brought. Uh, is there that kind of response uh, uh, in the education world? I think there's a lot of speculation about what will happen. Uh, some, of course, are referring to this period as the great resignation. Right, right. Uh, we're a mission-driven kind of organization and People are drawn to this campus because of our innovation vision and the impact of radical care on students. And I'm hoping that vision and mission are so compelling uh, that we continue because we have really great people here. Uh, we we want to keep them all. Well, I, I understand that. And maybe this book is an effort to uh, take your learnings and your perspective and uh, make it a gift, not only to the educational world, but, uh, you know, the, your focus on conversations as uh, an avenue of transformation uh, really appeals to everybody. It, it applies to everything. In your book, you apply it specifically to education. But as I read through your book, I thought, boy, I, don't, I know a lot of preachers that need to read this. <laughs> and, well, yeah, certainly human communication is absolutely powerful and mm -hmm. every spoken word has the potential for permanent impact keeping that in mind when we're conversing i think is an important principle now i want to start out by this you describe in the book nine conversations that need to happen 
And I was struck by the number nine <laughs> because you join a pretty elite uh, network of uh, culture and history. Let me just run through some of this. Dante in the Inferno describes the nine circles of hell. <laughs> the Enneagram <laughs> identifies nine personality types. A baseball team has nine players. The Supreme Court has nine justices. A novena is a prayer that's prayed for nine consecutive days. I wrote a little book called Nine Marks of a Good Sermon. And most important, John Prine, <laughs> the late great John Prine, in his song, When I Get to Heaven, says he's going to make a cocktail and smoke a cigarette that's nine miles long. <laughs> You're in good company. Where did the nine come from? Or is that just random? Well, I thought it was random until I heard uh, your take on all of this. So we'll have to think more about uh, the potential cosmic nature of the number of times. That's right. That See, being avoided. <laughs> you've been pulled into, as you say, a cosmic circle of some sort with the nine. Trouble in the academy, cultivating community, campus governance, isolation versus collaboration faculty reputations as uh, as the bad guy, education and money, student culture and identity, curriculum and change. You know, having been a professor uh, uh, for uh, a period and a trustee for a period, I recognize all of these. Yes, I think the, the conversations we need to have will take courage. So it's not random small talk, though that can certainly build our connections and ultimately trusting relationships, but really to courageously face the evidence of how we're doing and what needs to happen next and what some of the barriers are. And sometimes those conversations are most challenging because of who is and is not in the room. And that inclusiveness to the conversation is also a, a key factor in how generative those conversations will be in producing action. You know, I, your comment there about who's in the room and who's not in the room makes me think of the climate change conference that, that just happened and how our president uh, spoke repeatedly about the people who were not there, that, uh, that people who were uh, really central to the global community making progress were not, by their own choice, not in the room. So I, I, th I do think that is, uh, that is an important point. What, talk to us, describe to us, as you do in the book, how these nine conversations got started and why you included the people you did. I was very intrigued by this. Well, the book, approach was to illustrate that conversations are powerful. Mm -hmm. So the co-author and I, uh, Bob Zemsky, have been having these conversations for years and we come from different perspectives and we often disagree and try to work through things to get somewhere constructive. And we have conversations with others and perhaps you would simply call them friends or colleagues. Uh, but from those conversations with people who have particular expertise or perspectives, other new ideas come to generate mm -hmm. new action. So we were trying mm -hmm. to illustrate how this network of powerful human communication in our setting, but true in all settings, uh, can produce new ideas and bring about change that is lasting. So the book is written as a conversation between the two of us. And then for each of the nine topics, we bring in others to share their perspectives, specifically because we knew those perspectives were different than our own. Now, let, just as a, a logistic thing, were these conversations face to face or were these conversations through an email? Well, like just about everything else, our process was pandemic interrupted. So they began as face-to-face -face conversations with Bob traveling here to Rochester. And that was uh, just before things changed in March of 2020. And so then the conversations continued uh, through Zoom, through 
Google Docs as, as a helpmate uh, to, to the verbal conversations as well. So some of these were transcribed from actual oral conversations and some of them were um, edited from uh, written conversations. Am That's I right? Correct. Yeah. That's right. So we had a method we called serve and volley. So one uh -huh. of us would start and, uh, and the other would um, respond, react, try to change direction, shift the conversation or, or confront the thing we thought needed confronting with courage. And that continued back and forth uh, throughout whether we were um, able to do so uh, in person or via Zoom or if we were writing those interactions, which became necessary. Yes. And uh, um, but I really liked the uh, the conversational nature of this. Um, the, you know, it's uh, the language is different when you're in conversation than when you're writing a text. Um, and, um, uh, you know, your, your conversation partners in the book were very interesting to me, including your own daughter. <laughs> I thought, you know, uh, having, uh, knowing your daughter, uh, I was just stunned when I saw her name and thrilled to read through, uh, wow, how articulate she is, I'll have to say. <laughs> And I want to. I do want to talk about what she said in a minute, but um, uh, I, I found these conversations very intriguing. Well, so did I. And she was home uh, during the pandemic, and uh, we were having many conversations. And she was aware of the conversations that Bob and I and others were having to create the book. And we began to engage around the topic of the student perspective. And if we in the academy really know our students, and uh, that that was riveting conversation and mother-daughter talk often is, uh, but I, I was delighted to include her in the conversation. We also wanted to illustrate uh, that that's that's where we start with those uh, close to us, connected to us already, and then we move on uh, mm -hmm. to additional others. So you can see that the conversational style of the book, including the part with my daughter, uh, is very different from most books where someone declares right, right and right. has some kind of answer that they are postulating and working to persuade us with, you know, we're talking nonfiction. Uh, but here we're trying to illustrate that the new new ideas and forward project progress are going to come through the collective genius, uh, not through any particular individual. So I am a better chancellor because I hear my daughter's voice and mm -hmm. perspective as a young student and, and now graduate student. And that's the concept behind conversation. Well, as a preacher, uh, dealing with uh, the slow erosion of support for an institutional church, um, I have uh, dealt with this very issue as, you know, for the last 20 years, I've been involved with young adults. Your daughter says this in the book. Most of us don't know how to translate our passion for people and the earth, that is for living differently as a result of our awareness, into careers. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was such a powerful statement, how to translate our passion into careers. Yes, I think it's uh, right on point. It is, isn't and it? something all of us in leadership roles in a variety of contexts, certainly in education and, and for you, the church, need to hear. Well, you know, it's not just translating it into careers, it's integrating it into institutions because uh, we in the church are having this conversation all the time. How do we uh, attract these young adults who have a passion for people and the earth into an institution that too frequently has not had those passions and uh, we're suffering because, because of it. And I preached a sermon just two or three weeks ago about this issue, a, a, a calling upon my congregation to listen to the young people, <laughs> listen to what they have to say. 
uh, for uh, and uh, quit trying to get them into our space. We need to go into into their space. Very similar to what um, uh, your whole approach is here, uh, having conversation with with people on their turf. Well, Reverend Dr. Moody, may I say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> to your sermon, and uh, you know, I I look to this generation, whatever their name shall be, um, right. the generation coming of age during COVID, during the disruptions that have led to momentum around racial and social justice. Mm -hmm. I, I look to them to bring constructive change to the world and yet understand that it will uh, be uncomfortable. Yes, uh, it and, will. And, and that will be disruptive itself. Disruptive. Disruptive is the word. It's going to be disruptive to your institution and to mine. It's already disruptive to business. Uh, as these young people buy everything online and um, uh, it is going to be disruptive. This is uh, the hallmark of it, even without the pandemic. Well, That's that right. And we need conversations that are courageous uh, in order to make sense of things, the sense-making task, but also then there's the action-taking task to follow the sense-making. And conversation will see us through all of that if we have inclusive conversations and we approach the topics that we tend to avoid and we get out of protection mode into listening and action mode. Yes, this is this is exactly what churches need to hear. But you've you've brought up the cultural divide. You write in your book, we have been dismayed by how sharp the cultural and political divides with our communities have become. So let me ask you, um, what can universities like yours bring to the national healing process? Not only in the pandemic, but the political divide that has so gripped our nation? Well, we must accept the assignment that mm -hmm. you just gave. That is mm -hmm. to be sure. A first and core function that we serve there is the development of human potential. So all of the students we have, young and otherwise aged, um, their development, their awareness, of history, of current challenges, of design thinking to create solutions that do not exist now. Our development of our students is our number one priority and mechanism of influence on the broader culture. A specific example from our campus Good. is the creation of structured communities uh, in which there is diversity of of culture, ethnicity, language, uh, geography, and more, so that students experience how relationships are formed, how differences are bridged, and, and can take that into their futures. So uh, I, I just would speak to our number one priority. Uh, and that is the development of the human potential we have and the intercultural competence of, of the students who are with us. Well, you've mentioned two things here that we could do a whole program on each. One is these communities, these student communities of diversity. And I can only think how this strategy differs from the sorority fraternity system ex that exists on most university campuses where the selection process is exactly the opposite. Let's find people like us and live together because we have similar interests. Do you have fraternities and sororities on your campus? We do not. We're being hyper intentional about all that we are doing and have had the privilege to be a startup campus, right? So we started in 2009. There is much educational research to be brought to bear on educational practice. Mm -hmm. And while most campuses would have to go through a change management process to get from where they are mm -hmm. to where the research would point us, we were able to start with a blank canvas using research and applying it to practice. And in this area of building community, 
for the well-being, the thriving, the flourishing of all. Uh, we were able to do these structured living learning communities that uh, privilege diversity in mm -hmm. human relationships. And again, we think this will have a lasting impact on how our graduates are engaged in their communities. Well, of course, uh, when you set these uh, things in motion, you're creating a culture and a tradition that in 30 or 40 years, if not sooner, uh, we'll need to go through a different kind of transformation uh, to meet the challenges, uh, you know, after our time. Right. Uh, and I don't even think we have 30 or 40 years. No, I think I, the, the pace, the agility, it's accelerated and intensified. And so it's maybe 30 to 40 uh, days uh, or, uh, or months uh, until a significant change needs to continue. And I, I just want to mention, too, that the forming of, of community and of culture happens through human connection. And what's necessary for that? Conversation. Conversation is right at the core of it. But I can't help but think that, that rather than prioritizing diversity as the lasting good, that adaptation or change has to be the fundamental value because as you're just saying here, who knows in 10 years, 20 years, what challenges are going to force a, uh, a creative campus like yours to adapt yet again? Yes, deep, courageous conversations that are inclusive across multiple kinds of differences are inherently transformative. So change will emanate from such conversations. Give us an example of one of these, um, one of these uh, student communities on your campus. We have a community called Health Core. Core is an acronym for Community of Respect and Empowerment. Do you use that for all of these groups? We do have a variety of groups we're piloting and working toward having all students in a living learning community within the next few years. And by and, and you mean living so that they're living in uh, living eating. in community. In addition to conversation, we find eating together <laughs> to be an important part of building human con connection. I said in a sermon here just not too long ago, eating may be the most important thing that churches do together. <laughs> um, and of so course, the health, right at, yeah. what? The health course students sign a covenant to care for one another for their entire college journey. Wow. To lead on issues of equity and justice for our campus and to help one another academically uh, because it's going to take multicultural teams to bring solutions to all that ails us in health and education uh, and, and in your context of the church. And how does, how does this strategy, if you've had enough time to test this, impact student retention? Oh, yes. We, our, our faculty here do their primary research on student learning and development. So we have the facts, we have the evidence and data, and you know, GPA is higher for these students, retention is stronger, uh, completing the degree within the four years is stronger, and placement afterwards into advanced study or career launch is solid. We, we see this as a practice that is, is really important to fueling student success. And I assume that these relationships uh, formed in these learning communities continue after their graduation. That is how our alumni are calling back to us to say, mm -hmm. yes, these connections are lasting. And uh, while we're a young campus, I look forward to hearing about uh, professionals who were in living learning communities here at UMR uh, who are now out there solving the grand health challenges of the 21st century. Now, how do you uh, teach these students, these 
uh, communication skills that you demonstrate in the book and talk about in the book are 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 these practices built into these uh, learning communities, these living communities that you created? One of the ways that we are are teaching these kinds of concepts goes beyond the living learning community to all students. Uh, we use a tool called the Intercultural Development Inventory, and it is first a survey uh, and then a critical self-reflection and then a conversation uh, with a mentor, a, a, a staff member or a faculty member. Uh, and there's a mutual sharing within that conversation about where we are in our understanding of ourselves culturally and our multiple identities and where we are uh, in relationship to cultures and identities that differ from our own. And that's for every, every student. It is a, a time intensive process. Uh, and what we hear from faculty staff who participate as well as students is that this is valuable. We do this at three points at the beginning of the college career in the, in the middle and at as they near graduation so that awareness of their growth and practice of these skills is taking place. I want to ask you or comment ab about the cross-cultural element on it. Uh, I know our country uh, is more culturally and ethnically diverse than ever before. Um, what uh, what are the demographics of your student body? We are a, a diverse campus community. And for this, I am very grateful. I mm -hmm. learn from our students every day. We are 70% underrepresented. And what that means is mm -hmm. that uh, there are three categories of demographics uh, that are historically underrepresented in higher education. And those include uh, students of color and we are 42% students of color. They also include first generation right. students mm -hmm. uh, and those from low income families so low that they qualify for, for the Pell Grant. Mm -hmm. So under $50,000 a year for the family. And uh, we have the extraordinary privilege of having 70% of our students in one or more of those underrepresented categories. It gives us uh, a context in which communicating across difference is a daily practice. And that makes us all uh, better people. Uh, I was a, a faculty member at a, a liberal arts college that did not have that kind of diversity. And I was constantly advocating these things. Number one, that every student that enrolled come to campus with a passport and that everybody who graduated had a visa stamped in the passport. This was our strategy of getting our students overseas into a diverse, uh, uh, an experience of diversity. But what you're describing is the world really coming to your campus, isn't it? It is indeed. And I'm a great advocate of learning abroad as well. Simultaneously, we want to notice that uh, we have diversity available um, in the next neighborhood over, wherever right. we are. Wherever we are. Wherever, wherever we, are. we are. And, you know, one of the, the great divides currently is rural and urban. It is. And I'm so pleased that our campus for those from Minnesota, half are urban, uh, Twin Cities, uh, and half are rural. And uh, that in and of itself is a, a difference and is affecting all kinds of perceptions and is influencing uh, many divides in our country. So having the conversation across the rural and urban and truly listening and seeking to ascertain the perspective of the other as real, not right or wrong, but mm -hmm. real, real. Uh, is, is critical. You have been in a fascinating and very influential position, first as provost, well, first as professor, and then as provost, and now 
as chancellor there uh, at the university. But I want to ask you over your career, both as a person and a professional, and I ask this as a pastor, of course, <laughs> what spiritual disciplines have been central to your sense of self and to your success as a leader and as an educator? Well, you won't be surprised to hear me say that seeking out conversation with those I don't understand has been a soul feeder. And that creativity is really a, a core place of fuel for me, whether that's writing or speaking or listening or generating ideas. I'm I'm a question asker, a, a curious person. I want mm -hmm. to be creative. So anything creative uh, I see as, as a spiritual discipline as you're describing it. And also need to share my, my love of the planet. <laughs> I love to kayak and, and feel the stillness and be a part and be just aware of how I'm a part of the natural world. And, and that also is uh, soul feeding. I want to tell you, Laurie, that uh, I've had a lot of conversations with people about spiritual disciplines, but I can't remember anybody identifying, certainly at the top of the list, human conversation as a spiritual discipline. I want to thank you for that. And then I want to, and if you're interested in kayaking and outdoors things, I want to invite you to North Carolina, where we have a lot of hiking and a lot of kayaking and of everything in between. Well, thank you for that. You have some calm water because, yeah. We <laughs> I'm do. Courageous in conversation, but not so much uh, in, you know, rapids. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Lori, thank you for being in the meeting house today. Thank you for your book, your leadership, your example, your creativity. Thank you for your conversation today with me and with all the people around you. God bless you in your work. Thank you so much, Dwight. I've enjoyed talking with you today. Let's do it again soon, okay? Indeed. I'll be back in a minute. This is Dwight Moody in the meeting house where we have conversation on religion and American life. I have a commentary entitled, They Lit the Fuse. I'll be back. They Lit the Fuse. On Sunday afternoon, February 23, 2020, more than a year and a half ago, three white men using two pickup trucks tracked down a young black man out for a Sunday afternoon exercise run. They suspected him without cause or evidence of thievery in their neighborhood. After clumsily cornering him between the trucks, they confronted him with a loaded rifle intending to make, they say now, a citizen's arrest. He feared for his life, grabbed the rifle for what must have been a desperate act of self-defense. The armed vigilante pulled the trigger three times, killed Ahmaud Aubrey in the middle of the street. A week later, not yet knowing the fuse had been lit. Just a few miles away, I inaugurated this radio program. First on the radio, two Rejoice radio channels, 97.5 FM in Brunswick, 94.7 FM on St. Simons Island, both on the southeast coast of Georgia, the Golden Isles, I often call it. It was weeks before we knew about the killing as prosecutors and police neglected to take any action. That dereliction of duty would, nine months later, cost the district attorney her job at the polls, and another nine months would bring her arrest on charges of negligence. 
She's free on $10,000 bond right now, waiting trial. 10 days after I launched my radio show and before the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey became a regular conversation on the broadcast, police in Louisville busted into the home of Breonna Taylor, thinking it was linked in some way to a drug deal. In the confrontation, Brianna was killed. 